What's happening, everybody? Thank you for joining me for my third episode of the Nate Shelmer Show. This is going to be another dog training or dog trainer type episode. For those of you that are dog lovers out there, this is going to be one that you will enjoy. I'm sitting down with my good friend, Allie, who is a fabulous dog trainer. I've worked with her before. I had a great time training with her. I learned a lot from her. So we're going to talk about dog training. We're going to talk about some common problems that people run into and a little bit about the experiences that she has had and where she's learned from and some of the information that she will be able to share with you guys. So thank you for coming out, Allie. Anytime, anytime. Uh, If you don't mind, can you tell everybody a little bit about your background and where you learned dog training from and who you apprenticed with and everything else? Yeah, so um, I got my start in dog training through a local kind of small uh, obedience club type uh, business. So they did mainly um, group classes and a few private consultations, but for the most part, it was a group class based business. Uh, From then, I wanted to kind of expand my knowledge and my skill set. So I went to the Michael Ellis School for Dog Trainers. um, And there I learned under Michael Ellis, who is one of the most prominent dog sport trainer type uh, gurus kind of in the country. Um, So I learned quite a few skills in both just regular obedience, um, decoy work, uh, sport dog raising, things of that nature. Uh, from then I, from there I went on and I learned, I apprenticed under a couple different trainers. So I apprenticed under a trainer who, uh, has a very successful dog training business so that I was able to learn how to, kind of pick up a good business model for a pet dog training business and implement that. Um, Additionally, I have worked under a couple of sport dog trainers um, and I went and did an uh, uh, internship across the country for a couple of months under one of the top Mondio ring trainers in the country. Uh, Then from there, I came back to California and I started my own dog training company. Beautiful. That's a good learning experience to go through. And Uh, Some of you probably listened to the first episode that I did with Bethany, and we mentioned Michael Ellis. So he is a very well-known name within the dog trainer, dog training industry. I've learned a lot from him, and I never had the opportunity to go to his school, but I watched pretty much every single video and online training platform that he has. Uh, What was your favorite part about his school? Definitely my favorite part, I would say, actually, is when Michael goes off into kind of like a tangent. Uh, So sometimes he would start our lesson and then he would kind of go off on uh, just a a random kind of topic or something pertaining to dog training. Um, And so it was really nice to kind of see just that like off the wall kind of uh, spontaneous thoughts that Michael has. Um, Those are kind of something that I feel like you don't get to experience when you watch the videos online because they're kind of very rehearsed and edited. And so it's nice to just see him in that casual manner, I suppose pose did you do all the different courses that he offers because he breaks it down a little bit different than the tom rose school where i went to school where you just sign up you do the professional program and you go through it i know he has a course specifically focused on protection a course that is specifically focused on basic obedience and then advanced obedience and competition obedience then ring sport right yeah he has one for almost every single different main category yep for someone to come down which i think is really cool because you know, somebody who does have a background in training um, might be able to just sign up for his ring sport course. I don't know exactly what it's called, but, you know, instead of having to do the exactly. entire thing. But did you go through most of them since you were that was at the beginning of your career? Mm-hmm. Um, I actually went through the initial one. So I in my understanding is that most trainers have to go through what's called the obedience intensive course. Um, so that's a two week long course. And in that they kind of focus on the very basics of dog training, teaching a good marker system, um, setting a really good foundation for, you know, like a young adult dog or maybe an adult dog that has is green, has no training behind them. Um, and so from there, I kind of went and then did some internships with people that train in a like minded way as Michael so that I was able to further my skills in that sense. Um, And then I came back and did a decoy course. So basically what a decoy does is they get into the big bite suits and the dogs bite them. Um, So that was a ton of fun. And I was able to really expand my knowledge and my skill set as a decoy um, for different types of dogs. And so that was a really good learning experience. Which sport specifically were you learning decoy work in? Uh, Mondio ring. Mondio ring. Okay. And Um, so Mondio ring is a very popular ring sport in the United States. And 
it's a lot more than you, you kind of, uh, you're being humble about it. Like, oh, you just get in the suit and you get bit, <laughs> right? There's so much more to it. There's so much detail to it. Uh, you have, they, they have two different types of decoys too. You know, you have the helper decoy, not the helper decoy, but the uh, training decoy. And yep. then you have the trial decoy. Yeah. You know, and, and the ones who are super impressive are the ones who are able to do both. Yes. You have a client that gives you a call and they're running into some sort of issue. Doesn't matter what it is. Most of the time when a dog trainer receives a call, I'd say nine out of 10 times, it's somebody that has a problem, right? They waited too long. They didn't do the puppy classes. They didn't uh, imprint the puppy correctly, which we could talk about imprinting if you like, but they're running into issues now that the dog's a little bit older. Maybe the dog is at that fear stage, right? Between seven to nine months, or the dog is at the adolescent stage, or the dog has reached full maturity, and now they're running into different types of issues. When you go to somebody's house and you're getting ready to work with them and do their lesson, what is your... uh, I know you have to adjust with each dog, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's always adjusting, and that's that's the art of dog training is being yeah. able to take the science, figure out what situation is that you're dealing with, and adjust the science accordingly to be most effective for that particular dog. What is your normal approach, though, when you're working with somebody that has any sort of issue? Again, we don't even have to necessarily talk about yeah. what the issue is, but what is the process that you like to do when you first meet a dog and you're first working with a dog? and not a dog that's people aggressive, because that's one that's going to change the way you have to deal with the dog. But yeah. a dog that any other situation besides people aggressive. Yeah. Um, so personally, how I like to address things is um, first, I'm going to ask the owner a lot of questions. So I want to know, hey, does the dog like food? Does the dog like toys? What motivates the dog? Um, sometimes we have dogs that are motivated by nothing. That's okay. We can work with that. Um, But most of the time they say, oh, yeah, uh, Fido loves his kibble or Sparky loves to play fetch or something of that nature. Um, So then I want to use those things that motivate the dog to help them uh, learn the criteria. So when we first introduce a criteria to a dog, I want to be very fair and I want to teach them, uh, you know, what I mean through motivators if possible. Uh, One big thing that I actually tell clients is I say, hey, um, make your dog work for their kibble. So a lot of people kind of look at me funny. They're like, what do you mean? Like, you know, my dog just gets the food in the bowl. Um, However, I personally think that working a dog for a kibble, like for kibble in a low distraction setting is the best way to kind of help create a bond with your dog and then also teach them a good work ethic. Um, You know, and I'll tell people, hey, maybe skip one meal. If your dog says, I'm not working for my food, that happens quite frequently. Um, my personal dogs sometimes do that, you know, because they're just so used to the food being in the bowl. Um, and so if maybe let's say we, we offer the dog food, they're like, no, I'm not working for this. I say, Hey, wait a little bit, try again later. Um, then the dog's going to say, okay, now I'm willing to work for my food. Um, so in this way we can use food I like to use food more so over toys just because usually toys, they get really excited. Um, And so we want them to be in a calmer state of mind when we're teaching. Uh, So usually I like to use food and I do what's called luring. So I want to be able to manipulate the dog's head um, by having them follow my hand with food in it. And so in that way, once I control their head, I control the rest of their body. So if I move their head up, their butt will come down into a sit. Uh, If I move their head, you know, in a circle, they're going to spin, things of that nature. So I want to teach the clients how to teach their dogs to lure um, first and foremost. And then I want to be able to use that uh, to teach the dog different behaviors. So for example, um, pretty much any dog with any problem, I always want to start with like just the general obedience because I want to create a good learning environment and I want them to, the dogs to know that now they have to respect their owners and they have to work for things that they want. Um, So that's kind of my very starting procedure is usually, you know, hey, they're going to work for their kibble uh, and we're going to teach them just the basic obedience behaviors. And usually by making them work, do you find that the dogs end up becoming happier because now they almost have a job during the day or they have something to keep them a little bit more occupied than just sitting by the window and trying to collect the sunlight. Absolutely. Um, and then I also find uh, a lot of people that have problems, maybe let's say like digging or barking or things like that. Um, those problems also very largely decrease just by doing very simple, basic obedience. Um, cause like you said, now the dog is being mentally stimulated, um, which 
in my opinion, is far more important than physically stimulating your dog. So a lot of people say, hey, I have a dog and I ran it, I run it five miles a day and he's still crazy. Um, and I say, hey, well, what training do you do? Oh, well, we don't do anything. Um, most times when we do an hour lesson, the dog is far more tired than if they've gone on a five mile run. Because they're being mentally stimulated. Exactly. And that has been proven to exhaust a dog yes. faster than just doing physical exercise alone. And I like that you said that too, though, because one of my, one of the things that I agree with Cesar Milan mm -hmm. is that he often talks about is if we want to create a balanced dog, we want to make sure that they're being stimulated mentally, physically. They're also receiving that affection on a regular basis. So a lot of times some people might get the physical side and not the mental side, right? Absolutely. Or they'll get just the affection and not the mental. So by Absolutely. adding all of those, it really does help create create that stable, more balanced dog and just by implementing, Absolutely. Yep. implementing the obedience. So now you have the dog, you're working with the owner, you're teaching them those skill sets to be able to lure them uh, into different positions. The dog's starting to understand it. What's your next step to start developing maybe a little more reliability or make it more fun? Or what are things that you could do a little trick trick of the trade that you might have that could benefit somebody? Yeah. So um, one thing that I really like to utilize as far as, uh, you know, without starting to add in a bunch of training tools and things of that nature, um, I really like to add in uh, a practical rewards and B frustration. So a practical reward is something where, um, the dog's environment is rewarding to them. So for example, let's say that we're teaching the dog a place, meaning like, Hey, you're going to go put all four feet on your bed. Um, I'm going to teach the owners when for me personally, some people do it differently, but for me personally, I teach the dog all four feet go on the bed. When the dog chooses to lay down, we want to mark that moment and kind of good, good job. So, um, one really big thing that I do, cause I know that a lot of people have dogs that jump when, you know, new people come into the door, they're just frantic. Everything's like kind of chaotic cause the dogs are really excited. So what we want to do is we want to teach the dog, go to your place. As soon as that dog shows that they are relaxed, meaning they choose on their own to lay down, they kind of maybe like take a deep breath, like they are showing that they are now moving into a calmer kind of state of mind, I tell them now release the dog to go say hi. So the dog hasn't gotten any food, any rewards. Their reward is getting to go say hi to guests because they have cho like chose to um, relax. So in that way, we're giving the dog the decision. Um, and most times the dogs start to relax fairly quickly because they learn this is what gets me to go say hi to guests. Um, the other thing I really like to utilize is frustration. So especially with recalls, um, I love, love restrained recalls. So basically what that entails is we put the dog on a harness. Um, if we don't have a harness available, I just say to hold them around their chest. So one person holds the dog and one person is going to call the dog. The person that's holding the dog, their only job is to hold the dog back and then let them go when the person, the caller says the dog's name and come or just the dog's name, depending on where we are in training. Um, the call is going to show them some food or maybe a toy or maybe even just themselves if that the dog is really motivated by their person um, and they're going to run away. So this creates a lot of frustra like frustration and tension for the dog because they can't immediately go to their owners. And so that gets them really amped up and excited. When you finally let them go, they're going to rock it right to their owners because, you know, they've kind of been held back and have some frustration now. Um, so I like to use those things to build kind of excitement for doing the behaviors and that could help with speed as well exactly right now now you have a really nice fast recall and your friends are asking you how the heck did you get your dog to come to you so fast yep i added value to it that's exactly <laughs> what i did you know and um another thing that people will run into is from maybe trying to do a recall in the wrong situation yes you know if you're talking about doing it in a controlled environment now you have somebody where they're trying to call their dog but they haven't done any of the training and yep. the dog is now interacting with another dog or interacting with a person and they're trying to call their dog and they're wondering why the dog's not listening. And now the dog is learning not to listen because they didn't set the dog up for success. Exactly. That's another big thing that I talk to my clients about is management. Um, so while we're in the process of training, I say that management is key. Uh, so for example, just like you said, not asking your dog to come in a situation where they probably are not going to come. Um, if they're with another dog or, you know, there's, saying hello to their most favorite person and then you say come chances are the dog's going to ignore you um and like you said now the dog is learning oh i can just ignore this command um so in cases like that i tell my clients that they should have a different word that's more casual 
So especially with the recall. So when I say come to my dogs, that means come into my space and sit. Um, if I say let's go, that means just kind of be near me and like keep coming with me. Um, so that's a good way to kind of like get your dog's attention, but not using our come word um, so that we don't get them, you know, kind of used to ignoring that command. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And we have a dog that um, I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit here, but a dog that is maybe reactive on the leash and we're trying to work with that. So we want to implement all the obedience, the communication, the luring, everything you talked about before. And then also adding the leash pressure. We take the dog on a walk and this just popped in my head. And often I don't think about it until I'm actually in the situation working with the person and their dog. A lot of times people want to allow their dogs to smell whatever they want, to pee on whatever they want, to do all these different things. And they say, well, it's a dog. Shouldn't the dog be a dog? And and what's difficult about that is there's like this balancing act because, yeah, we want the dog to be able to go to the bathroom. We want the dog to be able to do things. However, if the dog learns that if I'm in a heel position and I just decide to go off and smell the flowers or pee on something, they're instantly breaking the heel position and they learn that that's okay. What are ways that people can use maybe a formal command, but then also implement an informal, like you were saying with the let's go, to make it to where they can play a clean balance to where it's clear to the dog, but they're not allowing the dog to not listen to them in a sense by breaking the command by doing something like peeing on a tree. So um, it's funny that you actually mentioned that uh, because I just posted something on my Facebook about this, uh, that exact scenario. Um, So... Basically, what I like to do for my personal clients is I want the dog to have a formal command, like you said, that means, um, hey, you're going to be walking next to me um, and there's no sniffing. We're, we're not peeing on things. We are purely walking right now. When I stop, you sit. You're, you have a job to do. Um, however, I tell clients, especially in the beginning when we're first starting this, uh, give the dog breaks. So I think I had mentioned it earlier, maybe I like every command that I do to have a beginning and an end. So the end is going to be a specific word that means now you're done doing whatever the command was, whether it's a sit or a place or a heel or anything like that. It's like a release word or kind yes, of a, okay. exactly. So a release word, um, I use the word release, <laughs> uh, for my clients so <laughs> to make things simple. So, um, you know, let's say the dog is in a heel position and they're being super great. They're rock stars. It's awesome. Um, and you can kind of sense the dog starting to get a little bit agitated, maybe like they want to go sniff or something like that. Once the dog has proven that they have been doing a good job and, you know, you can end things on a good note. Uh, I tell clients to release your dog for a couple minutes, let them sniff the grass, maybe let them go to the bathroom, do whatever they need to do. Um, you could even maybe walk them like that for a block if, if it's not too, you know, much of an inconvenience convenience for you and then call the dog back into the heel position and keep walking. So in this way, they get kind of what I like to call like brain breaks, um, where they don't have to be focused on being right in this position, sitting when you stop, like it's kind of, they have a chance to sniff and do whatever, but still, you know, we're coming back to that. Hey, now there's going to be control and we're going to continue walking nicely. I have another question to add to that. Okay. And this is actually a question that was asked that wanted to be addressed. I take my dog out on walks. And when I'm getting back to the house, my dog always pulls like crazy to the house. My dog walks nice when we're on the walks. But once I'm headed back to the house and my dog knows I'm headed back to the house, they pull on the leash, they're choking themselves out. How can I fix this problem? So this was a question that I, that was recently asked. So hopefully they listen to this episode. But how would you fix something like that? A dog that walks fine, but for some reason when we're going back to the house, it's it's choking its way back to the house. Okay. Yeah. So that's actually super common. Um, so dogs are very good at recognizing patterns uh, and dogs know when, you know, if we walk the same block or the same circle every single time, they know when they're going home. Um, and so this is a very common problem. Even like myself as a kid, I remember our childhood dog doing stuff like that. Um, so what we want to do is we want to break the pattern. So uh, for example, let's say that there's an alternative route to go back to the house. I say, hey, take that route. Um, maybe once, 
twice and then the third time we're going to go the normal route um or alternatively if there's only one route back to the home uh taking the dog and let's say you know they are starting to pull all right well now we're going the opposite direction so i want the dog to know that that behavior is not what's going to get them to back to their house is not going to get them to the end goal um so i'm going to do whatever it takes whether that's turning around and walking 15 circles before i go back to the house or uh you know maybe we get three quarters of the way to the house and we're going to just walk right past the house. Um, just whatever it is that kind of throws the dog for a loop so that they kind of get out of that cycle and that pattern of learning, Hey, uh, you know, if I pull, this takes me directly back to the home. So kind of breaking that cycle. So understanding patterns. I love it. Yeah. And that's something that a lot of people do. It's, it's, it's why, a dog, if somebody tells them to sit, the dog sits, lays down, and rolls over. Yep. Well, why is the dog doing that? Because they said sit, lay down, roll over a hundred times. Yep. The dog figures it out and starts to just do it. Now, you can use patterns, right, in a good way to yes. where it could help teach a dog a behavior. For example, I love using pattern training to teach the automatic sit when halted. Yes. I'll take five steps, stop, stop, and sit the dog. Five steps, stop, and sit the dog. Five steps, stop, and sit the dog. And then, yep. um, you know, and I'll mix it up a little bit too because then you're going to have a dog who's sitting at five steps yeah. as I'm trying to continue to walk if I don't do it. But that helps really teach the automatic sit when halted. But times where patterns could be bad, what people run into, which what is one of the worst ones for you where somebody does a pattern unintentionally and because of that, it creates some problems in the training. If you're not thinking of the one I'm thinking of, I'll tell you it, but I'm kind of curious to see which one you, you oh, see a man. lot. Oh, uh, man. Me personally, um, well, as far as my clients go, the one that I personally see a lot of is when we're doing leash walking, actually. Um, they only reward their dog when they stop and the dog sits. So the dog says why should i walk nicely when i only get rewarded when we stop and sit so they stop Ooh. beautifully and they sit wonderfully but the space in between is a little iffy not as good as it could be yeah because the dog is now seeking out the sit to get the reward instead of the nice walk exactly i've actually seen that quite a bit with uh, competition level tracking yes people will teach the dogs that they get the reward at the articles <laughs> right for article indication and basically um, you know, those of you that do not do any sort of competitive obedience, there's a sport called Schutzen. At least it's known as Schutzen. It's called IPO now, but it's broken down to three parts, tracking, protection, and obedience. And on the tracking, the dogs have to walk basically a perfect track where the human walked prior to them. And there's little articles on the ground and the dogs have to indicate on these articles by either sitting or laying down. But long story short, the trainers will reward the dogs only at the articles, at least a lot of trainers that I worked with. And then you have a dog who's rushing just to get to that article instead of effectively tracking, which can create issues. Um, the one that I see a lot is people putting their dog in a down or a sit or a climb. In fact, a, a good friend of mine who I trained with for a while as well, uh, her name's Ashley. What she used to tell people was, if you can't touch your pup, don't free him up, which I thought was kind of cute. It's a good way to remember it because what happens is a lot of times, and I'm sure you've seen it, people put their dogs in a stay they walk 20 feet away, they call their dog. Yep. They put their dog in a stay, they walk oh, yeah. 20 feet away, the dog <laughs> breaks the position, and they wonder why their dog broke the position because they started to create a pattern yep. where the dog goes, once you're 20 feet away, you release me, so, ah! and the dog jumps up and releases themselves. Yep, I and, do see that quite a bit. And the easiest way to fix it would be? Um, basically just varying it, breaking the pattern. So you walk away, you come back to your dog. Um, I tell my clients when we're working on sits, downs, or, you know, places or climbs, um, that, Hey, you walk 20 feet away and you come back to your dog every single time. Um, uh, maybe one out of 20 of those times we can recall the dog, but other than that, don't recall them. Cause like you said, that's very, very common is you get far enough away and they say great now it's party time i'm coming over mm -hmm. um maybe we didn't want that uh it can be downright dangerous in some situations like if you let's say you put them in a sit and you go across the street or something so we want to be really sure that we make sure to not have that particular pattern where we walk away and the dog just flies on over yeah and going back to the trainer that i was telling you about before who said if you can't touch your pup don't free him up that is the rule that she would give them for like the first couple weeks yeah right? because of course we still want an effective call exactly but we just don't want to teach the dogs that they can break once you're 
you know, however many feet away. Now, when it comes to working with a dog and adding corrections, I like how when we were talking at the beginning, you, you talk all about using luring, effectively communicating with the dog. Uh, there's probably been times where it's been three months before you even added a correction because you're puppy imprinting, you're training this dog for competitive obedience or whatever. What is the most common, if you are using a form of correction, when does a correction usually start for, um, uh, let's say, basic pet obedience? And that's if you're doing corrections, because I've worked with some people where they said, I don't want my dog to be correct. And I say, no problem. Absolutely. I'm yep. not going to make anybody correct their dog. Yep. It's your dog. You determine what you want. Same thing if somebody says, um, can my dog come on the couch? Can my dog jump on the bed? Can your dog? Yeah. You know, I, I really liked what Bethany said on my first episode. She goes, it's not a problem until it's a problem. Yeah. Right. And Absolutely. yeah, if you're letting your dog jump on the couch and there's no issues, but if your dog starts resourcing the couch, yes. resource guarding inside of the couch, then it can become a problem. I'm totally good with that because I don't want to make somebody use a tool that makes them uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. So I want them to feel comfortable training their dog um, and I want them to enjoy it. And just like you said as well um, about, you know, I don't, there's no universal set of being a good dog owner. If your dog goes on the couch, it's not a problem great. My dogs sleep in bed with me sometimes. That's how like, you know, they enjoy it. I enjoy it. It's not a problem. Um, so I, you know, same thing as you, like I tell people, yeah, your dog can go on the couch. Sure. Like no problem. Um, if it's creating problems, then we should address that. But otherwise it's not really, you know, you're not a bad dog owner for letting your dog up on the couch or your bed or anything like that. There are things, um, you know, we introduce pressure. For me personally, I introduce pressure to a dog. Uh, I try to wait as long as possible, but it's really dependent on the situation. So, um, you know, I have a very, very, very great client. They're excellent. Um, and their dog is a lab, a young lab, year old. And uh, she was jumping and just being a wild animal. Um, and her owner had gotten a hip replacement. So that is absolutely not acceptable for her to be jumping because she could really hurt him. Um, so in that case, we moved to a pressure, you know, a little bit quicker than maybe if it was just like a, a single, you know, young person who's like, yeah, whatever, the dog can jump on me. I don't really care. Um, so in that, you know, in that sense, I think it just kind of is dependent on the owner, the dog, uh, as far as when we introduce pressure. Yeah, and that's all that art that we were talking about, being able to figure out with each dog and which motivating factor is going to work best, you know. And before you said that you prefer using food instead of toys in the beginning, yes. when's a good time that somebody could use toys or start to introduce toys within their dog training as the reward if they no longer want to use food? When would be a good transition for somebody to, to make that? Yeah. So, um, what I tell people too, is it's very dependent on the actual exercise. Um, so like, for example, um, I, I think that adding toys in is a great way to add another level of control per se to your training. So, um, if a dog really loves to fetch their ball, they're going to be in a much kind of crazier, higher drive state of mind when we're throwing the ball. If you can get your dog to sit and remain seated until you release them to throw the ball, um, I think that's a mark of a very good trainer. So what I tell people is once your stuff is really, really reliable with food um, and in higher distraction areas, that's a good time to start implementing toys. Um, and it's super easy to do. Like I just said, you could be playing fetch with your dog. You know, maybe your dog brings the ball back one time and you stop and you say sit and you might have to wait a minute because your dog is probably going to be really amped up, really confused, like, oh, I've never been asked to do this before. The moment they sit, either yes and throw the ball or whatever their release word is and throw the ball. Um, and I think that's a great way for the dogs to learn, hey, even when I'm in a heightened state of mind, I still need to pay attention and listen to commands taking something like fetch and making it a training opportunity. Exactly. What about somebody who has a dog that likes to play fetch, but they can't get the dog to bring the ball back to them and they're having trouble getting the dog to out. What's one of the best ways you've seen with a dog that's, you know, happy go lucky lab that wants to play fetch, but also loves to hold on to that ball and doesn't want to bring it back. What's a good setup that you do to help teach or help somebody teach their dog 
how to bring it back to them, how to release it so they can actually play the game. Yeah. So um, a lot of dogs do like to play fetch, but they don't know the rules. And so, you know, that's something that uh, a lot of people run into, like you mentioned. So to help teach the dog the game, um, what I like to do is I like to have multiples of whatever the toy is. So if we're talking about fetch, uh, maybe I'll have 10 tennis balls, um, not where the dog can ex- like access them. They're going to be on me, on my person. Um, and I produce one, I throw it, the dog goes and gets it. And maybe they're kind of laying on the outskirts playing keep away they're not really sure um, I'm gonna put another ball back in like either my hand or the chuck it or whatever I'm using and I'm gonna say hey this ball is way better because now I'm making it move I'm making it exciting this is where the exciting thing is when they come back towards me I'm gonna throw it hey now you get this ball so they're gonna uh, drop the ball that's in their mouth because it's no longer a thing of value um, and so kind of playing two toy in that way that hey you trade me you drop this one and I'll give you this one I love a value transfer (laughs) and then using the prey drive to get them to go after the other one because the one becomes boring. And that's something that a lot of competitive dog trainers will do is they try to teach the dog that the toy or whatever it is, is more fun when it's with the human instead of running and just playing with the toy by themselves. Yep. Uh, What are some other common play things that you can think of that somebody might want to do with their dog, but the dog just doesn't know the rules? A lot of times I see tugging. Dogs aren't really sure about the rules of tugging. Um, I love to play tug with my dogs. Will tugging make a dog aggressive? (laughs) No. No. That's a very, uh, that is a common misconception that I have heard. Uh, No, it has nothing to do with aggression or anything like that. It's it's just a game and the dogs like to play tug. Um, I think it's a really great way to bond with your dog because it, like you said, it makes the playing very personal to you. So it makes you the bringer of the good things. Um, a little bit more personal, personable, I think, than just throwing a ball or, you know, maybe like giving them a toy and then going and sitting on the couch. Um, so a lot of dogs don't really know how to play tug correctly. And I think the reason for that is a lot of times people think tug means you rip the rope out of their mouth and now you've won it and this is how we play tug. This is not fun for the dog. Um, So if you think about it, if you were racing somebody, let's say someone challenged you to a fun racing match and they beat you 10 out of 10 times and they said, let's do it again, you'd probably say no, because this is not fun anymore. Um, You've never won. You've never even gotten close to winning. Why would you want to continue to play this game? So uh, I tell people when you're playing tug with your dog, let them win occasionally. Let them, you know, gloat and have their little thing and kind of like call them back to you to re-engage with the toy. That's the most important part. So a lot of times dogs will win it and they'll run away. Um, We want to teach them come back here because I'm going to continue playing the game with you as soon as you re-engage with me. Um, So a good way to do that is with the two toy, um, you know, having another tug to play with them. Or some dogs, even if you just kind of get their attention, maybe run backwards a little bit, make yourself exciting, they'll come back and re-engage with that toy. I'm so happy you said that because I was literally going to say something about, I was going to ask you, so is it good to show the dog that you're the stronger one by ripping the toy away from them, which a lot of people do, you know, and for some reason people look at dogs so differently than kids. And I know we talked about being anthropomorphic and anthropomorphic, being anthropomorphic is not a good thing. However, uh, there are some things, um, it's, it's like a balance though, because the analogy, analogy that I'm trying to make is people will have a new infant toddler, right? The toddler yes. just starts to walk around the house and they're following the toddler everywhere, yeah. right? They're making sure that they don't touch the outlet, that they don't touch something that could be sharp or whatever. They're, they're making sure that the child is safe. Then they get a puppy and they let the puppy do whatever they want in the house and wonder yeah. why the puppy peed on the floor and chewed the furniture and ripped up the trash can yeah. and drank out of the toilet bowl. Right. We, we need to address it the same way. But same thing, if I'm if if I'm working with a young kid and I'm, I'm trying to teach that kid a sport, maybe, or if I'm doing martial arts with that kid, I'm not going to just throw them down and put them in an arm bar every single time. <laughs> they're, they're not going to want to play. And people are so confused why, oh, my dog doesn't want to play when I'm showing them how big and tough I am. It's, no, yep. show the dog how big and tough they are. Yep. And that's something I try to push on people as well, because if you have a dog that is really confident and really does believe that they're super capable, you end up having a dog that's not aggressive Yeah. because they don't have those fear issues that can be developed by trying to create that submissive dog, which makes me think of something. What is your thought 
on the whole concept of creating a submissive dog. That's something people hear quite often. <laughs> um, so I hear, I also hear that a lot as a dog trainer is having a submissive, like a submissive dog or asserting yourself as an alpha or things of that nature. Um, so as most dog trainers know, the alpha theory was debunked um, pretty shortly after it was actually created. So the person who made it, my understanding was that he studied wolves in a type of situation situation that wasn't necessarily uh, like a wild population. It wasn't mimicked exactly to how wolves are in the wild. Um, So he published a book and he's basically like, hey, you know, there's alphas and there's betas and, and, you know, one of them kind of rules them all and and that thing. And so some dog trainers except took that theory and said, okay, the same thing applies to domesticated dogs. Um, and so now we have this widespread theory that you need to like shove your dog to the floor or make them roll over on their back or kind of silly notions like that to prove that you are the alpha of your dog. Uh, whereas, you know, we would both know that that isn't true. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a pretty funny bit. Uh, if you're listening to this, go to YouTube and pull up Adam ruins everything. Alpha, (laughs) alpha wolf. It's, it's pretty funny. Uh, now the thing with it is there are some dogs within a group that will seem to um, present the alpha type behaviors. And so it's not saying it's just it's more about how we define the word alpha. And what I've noticed, and you probably notice the same thing, if you have a family that has multiple dogs, which one doesn't matter size or anything, but which one tends to be the one that would present themselves as the alpha? Um, usually the dog that's been there the longest, the longest. Yep. yep. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. And that's how they do it. It's, it's more about, it's the same structure that we have as humans. You know, the grandparents are kind of the most senior and then the parents and then the kids, <laughs> and they usually fall under that structure. But what are some of the bad things that may develop from somebody who is using some of these techniques and trying to be the alpha and alpha rolling their dog or trying to make their dog submit. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, Well, I have actually seen, it depends, you know, kind of what the issues are that the people are experiencing in their home. But um, first and foremost, you can ruin your relationship with your dog. Uh, You know, the dog doesn't understand if if you roll them onto their back on the floor. They don't, they don't get it. They don't understand that this is you somehow asserting yourself over them. Um, They're just scared. So a lot of times people unintentionally ruin their relationship with their dog and then also create unclear communication with their dogs um, because the dog is kind of you know maybe our rules and our boundaries are a little loose and so suddenly we get really angry and we quote unquote assert ourselves as alpha and now the dog's saying hey what did I do wrong I don't know I have no under I have no understanding of this um Additionally, if dogs that have aggression um, or reactivity or things of that nature, a lot of times it can worsen the problem um, because we're not actually getting to the root of the issue. We're just kind of maybe mitigating some surface level kind of issues or or, uh, symptoms. Right. So if a dog, I've seen this before, especially living up in L.A. as long as I lived up there, being at a dog park or something like that, somebody's dog might get a little excited. They take the dog, hold it down for a couple seconds, which, yeah, sure, it stops the dog from being excited in that moment in time. But the minute they let the dog back up or the second, rather, the dog's doing exactly what it was doing before. Yeah. It's not teaching anything and it's not clear communication. And that's something that in my opinion, is probably one of the most important things is clear communication. And how can people become a little bit more clear with their dogs? What are some of the mistakes that you see as most common where people are unintentionally confusing the heck out of their dogs? Yeah. um, Well, unfortunately, it happens quite frequently um, because we love our dogs. And as we should, you know, dogs are really great. And so there's a reason that they're called man's best friend. Um, So the problem that comes with that is that uh, we tend to treat our dogs like humans. And so in this sense, um, we talk to them like people, we give them quote unquote timeouts or warnings or things like that. Um, dogs don't understand that. So they need a really black and white picture of this is wrong, this is right. Um, If we allow them to make their own decisions, sometimes they'll make a good choice and sometimes they'll make a bad choice. Um, But if we have no way to let them know that they're doing right or wrong, they're going to be incredibly confused. So a lot of times what I see is people will let something slide uh, for maybe five, six, seven times. And then the eighth time, now this is really annoying and this is really bad. So we're going to have a huge correction, um, whether that be with our voice or, you know, 
pinning him to the ground or whatever people do commonly. Um, and now the dog is confused because they, they were allowed to get away with it for the first seven times. So why now on the eighth time is this a problem? Such as jumping up on somebody or maybe yep. jumping up on the furniture. Yep. They allow it for a long time. Then they get frustrated one day or maybe they have nice clothes on. Exactly. And the dog jumps up and now they get mad and they just confuse the heck out of their dog. Yep. Uh, something that was requested uh, on the last podcast that I did um, was to talk a little bit about leash reactivity. So we didn't address that very much on my first episode. And I think that would be good to talk about because it is a really big problem that people have. And I'm sure it's something that multiple clients of yours have oh, asked yeah. you for help to fix. So what is, what, what's the most common thing that you see with people that have dogs that are leash reactive and what are some of the best solutions in order to help fix it or make it a little bit smaller than what it is? Yeah. So, uh, you're right. I do see a lot of people that have dogs with leash reactivity. I'd probably say the most common breeds are like goldens, labs, shepherds. Um, they're dogs that may not necessarily be aggressive, but are very overly friendly. Um, so the one thing that I see is that a lot of people have dogs, um, the dogs develop or come to them with leash reactivity and they assume that the dog is aggressive. Um, most of the time, this isn't the case. They're not aggressive with other dogs. There's just a lot of tension and excitement going on within them when they see another dog. Um, so I think one mistake that people make is a not trusting their dog. So then they say, Hey, like I've never let my dog play with another dog. I've never let my dog see another dog, anything like that. Um, because they think that now this is aggression. Um, that being said, not saying that you should just walk up if your dog is barking and growling, you shouldn't just be like, oh, Fluffy wants to come say hi and walk right up to the other dog. Um, but, you know, I think that most of my leash reactivity cases are dogs that are very, very friendly. And that's where the reactivity comes from. So it's not always based in aggression, per se. Um, as far as mitigating leash reactivity, uh if you have a very food motivated dog, you can definitely teach them engagement. So, hey, like when you look at me, you get food, um, but it takes a lot of the owner being very observant. So before the dog sees the other dog coming, the owner ideally will be saying, hey, look at me. Here's some food. Good job. Um, the problem with that is if your dog, A, isn't food motivated or B, uh, is more interested in the other dog, now you're going to have a problem. So um, this is kind of where... Uh, we need to explore the other quadrants of kind of learning theory and um, start to use maybe a little bit of leash pressure. Uh, would you mind defining leash pressure? Yeah, so leash pressure is basically um, teaching the dog that, hey, the leash is going to get tight or there will be tension on the leash. Um, for whatever reason, maybe the dog decides, hey, I don't want to walk anymore and I'm going to plant my feet in the ground or uh, I'm going to stare at this other dog or whatever. Once the dog comes with the pressure, uh, meaning that they step forward into the leash creating slack, then the, the quote unquote pressure turns off. So they're, they're learning here that there's a mild discomfort of feeling maybe like a leash around or the collar around their neck or the leash tighten. And then it stops once they move into that pressure. And that means the leash can become a form of communication to the dog. One more tool to add to your repertoire in order to effectively and clearly communicate, which we already noted is one of the biggest problems that a lot of people run into. So a lot of times for leash reactivity, uh, we can use, you know, a leash to either a guide our dog away from the situation or B, um, even doing like some small leash pops, which would mean basically you let the leash get a little slack and then give it just a little tug um, to kind of snap the dog out of that mind state of being kind of hectic and, and really frantic looking at the other dog and kind of starting to bark or putting their hackles up or things of that nature. What would be the next step if the leash pressure isn't working? If you keep pulling the dog back and the dog stops for a second and runs back the end of the leash and continues to bark. Uh, what I like that you're saying earlier is, is in a way finding something that the dog wants and then using that as a tool to get the dog to do what you want. But it's very difficult if the dog really just wants the dog in front of them. Yeah. So how could you use the dog in front of them in an effective way to help teach the dog not to pull? Um, so if the dog in front of, you know, let's say that we know both dogs in this scenario and both dogs are friendly or, you know, we know that this is a controlled situation, um, 
one potential way it would be, you know, we give some leash pressure once the dog is maybe engaged with us or just gives us a second of looking at us and, hey, now, you know, you're paying attention to me and I enjoy, you know, that you're giving me attention, you're following the leash pressure. Um, we could let the dogs meet or say hello to kind of get, a, you know, some of that reactivity, the tension and stuff like that kind of move away from that. It's beautiful. Yeah. So it's exactly what I was hoping you would say. We're, we're, <laughs> I was like, is this a trick? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, yeah. So what we're doing in a situation like that, cause it's a technique that I use as well. And I like that you said controlled environment. Cause that's something that a lot of people don't do is they will not rehearse situations that they want their dog to act a certain way. And, uh, you know, that was a great, a great analogy that I would use when I was in LA is I'd say it's like theater. You know, somebody's going to perform in front of an audience. They don't just step up day one and hope to be able to perform and do it perfectly. They rehearse every single day. So when that day comes, they know exactly what to do. Exactly. And we need to do the exact same thing with our dogs. We need to set them up in scenarios that we want them to perform a certain way, whether it's people coming over or going out on a walk. Yeah. So taking, you know, a friend that has a dog that is more calm and relaxed and using that dog as a tool to teach yours. Hey, if you're sitting down and you're relaxing or you're not getting overly ex excited, we'll slowly start to move towards the other dog. But the second yep. you get crazy, you don't move. Yep. So it's that simple concept of cause and effect. And it's beautiful. It works amazingly. And what are some of the biggest problems that you have seen with dogs that develop fear issues based on some of the bad things or accidental things that someone may do? Yeah. Um, I definitely see dogs, a lot of dogs that I see that have fear issues or nerve, you know, they're kind of nervous. Um, they're not really sure. Maybe, you know, in the home they have some problems. Um, a lot of times they're accidentally created by their owners. So, um, and it can be genetics though too. Yes, absolutely. So, so that's very important to know. It's a very important uh, kind of piece to, to say is that uh, I've also seen some dogs that have a lot of problems um, and it's not that the owners did anything wrong. They were just genetically kind of weird dogs or something was wrong or with them. Or very fearful mom when they're within the whelping box or yes. something, you know, and the puppies will pick up the behaviors of the mom. And yes. so then, you know, sometimes it's not the human's fault, Absolutely. but quite often it can be. Yes. And it's not intentional. Yes, exactly. So like you said, like, you know, people, we love our dogs and so we, you know, we tend to think of them as like little people uh, it, when it suits us, per se. Um, however, a lot of times we'll talk to our dog like a human being. Um, they don't understand English. They don't understand any language, really, unless we teach them what the words mean. Um, not saying in like a full sentence. Uh, if somebody teaches their dogs full sentences, I'd love to meet this person. <laughs> so if their dog can speak English. But um, so, you know, when we say... Let's say the dog uh, is barking out the window at something and we say, oh, it's OK. And we're petting the dog. We're now reassuring them that that is a good behavior to do. Or if they're afraid of loud noises and the, like maybe a, a truck backfires or something and the dog jumps and gets spooked. Oh, it's OK. That's you're doing a good job. We are now reaffirming to the dog. That was a scary thing. You definitely should have been afraid of it. Um, and so in that way, we're, we're kind of creating a nervous dog. Um, the other thing that I see is when dogs don't have structures, boundaries or rules in their home that they become nervous mm -hmm. um, because there is nobody to kind of guide them or lead them per se um not be an alpha but to kind right. of just you know be uh to, to show them what their role is i suppose in the household um they take it upon themselves to give themselves something a role or, or something of that nature you know if you have a family and there's three kids and the two parents and everybody is implementing different rules and expecting Absolutely. different things from the dog that can confuse the heck out of them yeah so yeah. what could somebody do to mitigate those problems when it has when they have a large family like that yeah um so i i love working with families especially with children um because i feel like they really should be a part of the training process as well as the adults in the home um and for the children I like them to learn like, hey, let your mom and dad handle like our formal commands or have your mom and dad present when we're when we're practicing. Um, that way the adults can assist the children. Um, and I also like teaching the children how to do tricks with the dog so that uh, the dog has some idea that these smaller humans should be respected and bring good things and aren't super confusing. Um, however, 
for the most part, I like the adults to handle the training style. And then I also, um, sometimes, you know, I have to get frank with people and I say, Hey, you guys need to be on the same page. Cause if you're not on the same page, um, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your dog's time and you're, you're wasting your money on, you know, hiring a dog trainer. Um, because everybody needs to be on the same page here. So, you know, if, if mom says the dog can't jump on people and the dad says, well, it's not a big deal. Now the dog's going to be confused. Exactly. Yeah. And also what's important is teaching the children how to properly handle a dog. Absolutely. Right. So they're not pulling, you know, something I hear, it always just drives me crazy where somebody says, I want the dog that allows my kid to pull the tail and pull the dog's ears. I'm thinking to myself, that's pretty cruel to the dog, isn't it? Yes. Wouldn't it be better to teach the child how to properly respect the dog so the respect goes both ways? Yep. So that's um, one thing that I really like teaching children um, when we work on the place or you call it the climb when the dog goes to their bed or something is, hey, um, we can tell the dog to go to their bed, but this is their space. This is their bedroom. Um, Nobody, you know, it'd be rude if your brother came barging into your bedroom. You probably wouldn't like that. So we want to teach, we want the dog to know that this is his bedroom and that he's not going to be, um, you know, barged in on or laid all over or anything like that when he's there. And then additionally, what I like to teach dogs is go to your place if you need space per se. Um, So this is a good, a really good boundary in a way to teach the children, don't touch the dog if the dog's in the place and teach the dog, hey, if you're feeling uncomfortable around the children, you go here and you won't be bothered per se. I think that's, yeah, I think that's awesome because I've run into people as well where maybe one child out of the four might be a little too invasive for the dog. Yes. And they're having a hard time even controlling their youngster. Yes. That ends up getting too much in the dog's face. And by teaching the dog, hey, if this is a situation, I want to escape it. Yep. They go to their bed, which will prevent a good dog yeah. from biting somebody. Exactly. Right? You know, and I, I hate when something like that happens. It's a nice dog, but the child isn't being supervised and the child is doing yes. the things like pulling on the ears and pulling on the tail and doing these things that is really unpleasant. And eventually the dog does a correction, yes, which would be the same correction that they would give another dog. But now you have this infant or young child yes. freaking out. And now a dog at no fault of their own is being taken to the shelter or being put down or something like that because of the improper, respect that needs to be given you know i mean i wouldn't want my ears pulled exactly so knowing like hey this is my safe spot i can go to and the kids knowing when the dog's there don't go to them yep you know and and what uh ali's saying is the climb is or i call it a climb she calls a lot of trainers call it a place but all it is is it's the dog's bed that's really all it is you can make it i had a client once that had two mastiffs and their their dog's climb bed was a really large uh futon (laughs) <laughs> right so it's just something elevated for the dog to go to it's their place where they can hang out they can chew their bones and it's a really really uh excellent command to teach i highly recommend everybody teach us so i'm glad you brought that up what about the um a common thought that people have it's a saying you can't teach an old dog new tricks yeah and i believe that the reason why it may seem like that is only because a dog, the older a dog is, the longer they practice the behavior, yes. the more ingrained that they believe that it works. Absolutely. You know, it's just like with a person, if somebody does something 10,000 times and it works 10,000 times, the one time it doesn't work, they assume that that's the fluke. Yep. Right. And they're going to continue to fight through it. So it's not that you can't train or teach an older dog new tricks. What about somebody who says, my dog always chases squirrels? How can I get my dog not to chase squirrels? I know that's something that comes up. Or my dog chases rabbits. Or my dog, here's another big one that you probably hear, fence fights. Oh, yeah. Or my dog digs in the yard. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. What are good ways to address these issues? Oh, man. You just gave me a whole list. Uh, All right. So (laughs) um, I think that there's a lot of behaviors. So, um, you know, on one hand, I really enjoy, like, giving the dogs a, a different outlet. So let's say for digging, for example, they're like, my dog chronically digs. Um, if it's possible, I'm going to say, hey, like, let's look at your backyard. Um, what can we implement into your backyard for your dog to do instead of digging? So maybe like if the dog likes toys, uh, we'll hang a rope 
from a tree and they can play with the toy by themselves. Or maybe we need to add some toys in general and this would make the dog happier and be able to do things. Um, some dogs don't care about toys or anything like that and they just want to dig because it's fun. Um, so in this case, we have to figure out how to tell the dog that's not an acceptable behavior. Um, so personally, what I do is I implement a negative marker. Um, so basically when I say no, no means in this very moment you are doing something wrong and you need to do something differently. Um, what they do differently is dependent on, you know, whatever. Let's say I, we're going to our recall and the dog ignores my recall. I say no. Now the dog should know, okay, I've made a mistake. I need to turn around and come back for the recall. Um, for fence, you know, digging at the fence, if I say no, the dog's like, okay, well, this means I shouldn't be digging maybe, you know, I should go play with a ball or I should come inside or do something like that. So offering an alternative behavior to the dog after we've given the negative marker, I feel like it's very important. Um, but having that negative marker lets the dog know in this moment is when you've done something wrong. Um, cause if we correct our dog for digging in the backyard, once they're coming back towards us, we've lost the opportunity to really effectively communicate with them. So I'm all about being practical and about having the dog adapt to our environment versus us adapting our environment to satisfy by the dog so that makes sense believe it or not we are out of time so before finishing up the rest of this episode uh where can people find you how can they get a hold of you do you have any videos that might be available for them anything that can add value to our listeners yeah um so i have a dog training business called candid canine um it's candid with a k makes the spelling a little confusing so it's k-a-n-d-i-d k and then the number nine and that will be in the description below yep um and so i'm on facebook uh instagram and I do have a YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to start posting some more videos here in the new year. Um, but most of my videos right now can be found on my Instagram and my Facebook page. If somebody wants to request a specific video from you, a training video, because I'm hoping this spreads worldwide, <laughs> you know, uh, first of all, where are you located? So the people that could actually hire you and work directly with you. Yeah, so um, I am in San Marcos, California, which is North County, San Diego. Um, so I service all areas between uh, Temecula and San Clemente all the way down through San Diego. Um, so I'm kind of within like a two hour span there of the San Diego County. Um, and so, you know, if you're in San Diego County and you're looking for a dog trainer, um, that's where I am. There's also a ton of other really great dog trainers in the area. So if I am booked, I can refer you to somebody that is also a good trainer, such as Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And um, if somebody is to email a request for a video or something like that, since you're going to be producing more YouTube videos, where would be the best place for them to send you that message? Yeah, um, either... You know, Facebook or Instagram would probably be the best way. Um, on my website, there's also a uh, inquiry form. I suppose mentioning I have a website would have been a good idea too. <laughs> I'll, I'll post that as well the, on the description. Um, so just, you know, either that way or uh, on my Facebook, I just started a um, weekly question of, or question of the week rather. So um, there's like a comment section below the video. So if you leave a comment and say, hey, here's my question, um, I'm going to try to address each question. If I have have a surplus of questions I'll probably do two questions of the week or something of that nature to keep up with the request so all right well believe it or not that's a wrap <laughs> thank you so much for coming out I really had a great time talking with you cool thanks for having me <laughs>